Next item is recognition of visitors. Uh, and I usually go through this every month, but just the quick rules for public comment. Please approach the podium one at a time, stating your name, municipality, and topic you'd like to address. A lot of time is three minutes per individual, six if you're representing a group. All comments should be directed to the board and not to staff or other participants. The board will not act on any comments that are made during the meeting. The presiding officer may direct the district administrator to follow up with that individual at a later date. And the public comment section will be limited to 30 minutes unless board action is taken to extend. And please refer, as always, to our public comment policy listed on the agenda for a full description. Thank you. So would anybody in the audience care to be recognized at this time? Yep. Come up here, Israel. Can everybody hear me okay? Sure. <laughs> All right, you go like this. Now, well, here we go. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> hello, board. Thanks, Am I on? All right. I don't have a problem being loud. <laughs> hello, board. I'm Israel Haas, father to three kids in the Prescott School District. My oldest is graduating in two weeks. Woohoo! My youngest is in seventh grade. I've uh, chosen to stay here in Prescott and keep my kids in Prescott schools because I love Prescott and I believe in the schools. So board, administrators, teachers, you're doing an amazing job as you shape and educate my kids. And I'm so grateful for it. In addition to being a dad, I'm also a volunteer with Cooley River Trails, proud to show my allegiance. For me, the whole idea of the trail system started on October 31st, October 31st, 2019, when Dr. Spakuza caught me after a Chamber of <coughs> Commerce meeting and invited me to check out the new trails on the school district property. At the time, I was the executive director at the Great River Road Visitor and Learning Center at Freedom Park. He asked me if uh, I might be interested in partnering in some way to utilize that space just south of the new high school here, and I said, absolutely. Soon after that, I began working with Michael Kozmowski and a couple of others to sketch out a high-level plan for creating a trail system that included the wooded ravines just south of this building. In uh, April of 2021, I presented the vision for Cooley River Trails to this very board. I showed a video of our National Park Service partner, Barrett Steenrod, talking about the educational and recreational potential of the wooded areas in uh, what we call uh, Zone 1. He was uh, standing on the very parcel that uh, you have proposed to sell. Over the next two years, we formed a Zone 1 committee consisting of school administrators, teachers, and community, member, uh, community members to plan for trails and outdoor learning environments on this property. You uh, also assigned a school board member to represent us on the Cooley River Trails Steering Committee. In uh, March of this year, you, the board, passed a resolution of support for Cooley River Trails in which you acknowledge that the Prescott School Board has reviewed and supports the vision of Cooley River Trails uh, and the City of Prescott's Comprehensive Outdoor Recreation Plan. You acknowledge that the vision includes support for creating environments conducive to outdoor education and athletics for K-12 through students during school hours and eventually for public access during non-school hours. The 14.6 acre parcel of land that you're proposing to sell has tremendous potential uh, for educational value and is a key part of the overall trail corridor. The vision for Cooley River Trails is to harness unbuildable sections of land for public good. Trail systems like this in other communities have attracted new businesses, new visitors, and new families, which ultimately increases the number of students in the school district and increases revenue from the state for the school district's budget. There's a rich history of options that we can bring to consideration to add long-term educational value to the natural and unbuildable areas of the school district property, just south of this building. That's why we're asking you not to sell the parcel without guaranteeing access for students and the community. So thank you so much for your leadership and for your service to my kids and the people of Prescott, I don't envy the difficult decisions that you have to make every time you meet here. So thank you very much. Thanks, Israel. Thanks, Israel. Anybody else care to be recognized here? Come on up.
probably a lot louder for me. Okay, um, hi, my name is Jerry Schmitz. Uh, I'm a citizen of Prescott. I live at 207 Locust Street North, uh, right next to the Minnesota Media School. I have a daughter who just recently graduated Prescott High School, and I have another daughter in Prescott High School. Um, you know, I'm a middle school cross country coach. I'm a chaperone at the ski club. I, uh, I volunteer for school trips and all, lots of other things in town. Um, I care a lot about this community. I care a lot about this school. I also am a very active volunteer with the Cooley River Trails, um, and I'm a local and I'm a board member at Freedom Park Visitor Center and Learning Center. So I come here today uh, about the board's consideration of selling that 14.6 acres. Um, you know, basically, this land is incredibly beneficial to the school and to the community, and I want to just state that I do not believe this should be sold off to a private entity. Um, in addition to the things that Israel said, uh, considering some, the trail planning corridor, as well as safe pathways, um, and I believe this land also has great potential to be maintained, utilized, and registered as a Wisconsin school forest. You know, I think that there's been conversations about this uh, earlier on, years ago, um, but I don't know if there, anything came to fruition about it. But um, I just spoke with Gretchen Marshall the other day. She is the leader and the coordinator of the Wisconsin School Forest um, organization through for the state of Wisconsin. And she gave me <coughs> great information about the benefits of being registered school forest. You know, about it being a remarkable educational resource that's available to help meet state and core educational standards. It serves as a focus to integrate environmental education in the curriculum, strengthen school community relations, and demonstrate sustainable natural resource management. So the program that they talked about when I talked to her the other day was that they can assign, they would assign a DNR steward to assist with ecology and environmental needs on ours, find seedlings and plantings that we can get uh, resources to. They would provide us educational programming for our teachers to give to the students and to be able to utilize in that school for us. Um, we'd be able to, dem you know, they'd be able to also connect us with resources and funding, grant opportunities, and different things that we can do to maintain trails, build trails on behalf of the school district, and not just another organization or a city entity, but for and within the school districts as uh, as a service part of that. So, you know, and, and it's uh, the things that this they talk about. Um, what a school forest will do, you know, for students and everything like that. It'll provide these like great opportunities to encourage physical activity, improve student health out in the woods. It'll improve, uh, make lessons more relevant by using meaningful real world situations and uh, lots of other things that we can utilize using a school forest. Um, for the parents and families and communities, it can create a more environmentally literate population that will sound long term community decisions, create a sense of ownership among parents, families, students, community members. It'll uh, increase community safety. Studies show that crime decreases as community spends more time outside in a positive environment. So schools throughout Wisconsin value the utilization of school forests. You know, just four years ago, River Falls was able to open up 70 acres that they've been holding onto since 1947 that they had no access to. They had it completely landlocked down by the Kinnicknick River, and all these years they've been trying to figure out a way to make it happen. They've kept on that, they've held on to that land, and now they just got a grant with the Kinnickneck River Land Trust to connect it, so now they've opened up this huge plethora of trails to the public and to the community and to the school district for that value. Wisconsin has over 27,000 acres of school forests, and they represent 255 school districts. I think Gretchen had told me that it was half the school districts basically in the state have school forest land. You know, the benefit of this land as a school asset should not be overlooked and simply be considered useless because it doesn't have a manicured field or a building on it. It has a rich, rich ecological and educational value that is valuable to the school and its community. So we hope you see that vision and that reasoning to not sell this land and keep it for our community and our schools. So, thank you. Thanks, Jared. Thanks. Anybody else? Come on up. I'm trying to keep it at three minutes. I wasn't was a little long, but that's okay. Thank you. Don't worry about me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my name is Joel Rice. I've been in this town all my life. My parents, all my brothers and sisters went through the Prescott High School. My parents went through Prescott School System. All three of my children went through Prescott School System. And my number one thing is I made an offer on a partial portion of that land that would not affect the trails. I'm looking at two to two and a half acres, I don't know exactly, below my house down to the ravine. The other side is where the trails are looking to be put at. 
This would give money into the system without hindering the chance of, of future trails. And I just want this because I love my privacy. I love living in the country. My wife wants to live in town. And if you know, if you've been married to my wife, you know where you're going to live. Okay? <laughs> I love the lady dearly and we want to stay there. And I don't want to get into developing the housing at all. That would be a shame. And they do not make more land. I don't care how you try, they don't make more land. So this would help a compromise situation. I would not develop it myself. I can't guarantee you what the next landowner would do to it, but I would not develop it myself. It'd just be for my own privacy. And they, you have the numbers up there. The only thing I'd make a slight difference, I would make just a little bit larger s section than what's drawn on the thing that I would like, just to guarantee my privacy. So the people would be entering from the backside where the trails are at, and that'd be it. So Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to point out to the board, uh, to the public here that the, the, we have a closed session item on this. After this, we have not seen any information on any of the bids that have come in. So we haven't. So just for the record, we haven't seen anything yet. So we'll, we plan on looking at, at that after the after the open session. So thank you. Go ahead. Come on. <coughs> up. Hello. So I'm Kirsten Thompson, a resident of Prescott and a volunteer for Cooley River Trails. And I'd just like to voice my support of Cooley River Trails and um, everything that's been mentioned regarding the benefit that could happen related to Cooley River Trail in Zone 1. I want to underscore that that could be a very, very positive thing for the city of Prescott, and I appreciate your consideration um, with that regard. Thanks very much. Thanks, Kristen. And also, I'd like to just point out that we do not have an agenda item on this tonight. There's, there can be no vote. We're looking at it. We'll talk about it more in information and discussion, but I just wanted to let folks know that there's no vote tonight on, on this item at all. So, any other, anybody else care to be recognized? <clears throat> Hello. I'm Holly Larson. I'm an outdoor recreation planner with the Rivers, Trails, and Conservation Assistance Program of the National Park Service. And I've been working with the Cooley River Trails group for about three years now since it was, uh, the idea was conceived. And there's an excellent team working to develop this trail, uh, system of trails and conservation areas. I uh, want you to consider this, that according to the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, in Wisconsin, 72% of high school students do not meet the recommended daily physical activity guidelines. And 75% of high school students in Wisconsin spend three or more hours of screen on screens um, every day, um, and that's not including schoolwork. So um, physical activity helps reduce the risk of all sorts of uh, different uh, illnesses and conditions that can be life-threatening. And habits formed uh, for physical activity um, during youth can carry over into adulthood, uh, leading to healthier adults and healthier communities. So a trail can be used for active transportation to and from school on the property that you're considering and also uh, as transportation to get to the city park. And, uh, and then also, of course, for recreation. Uh, so opportunities for um, trail connections, uh, once they're lost, uh, I can tell you from experience in working with communities all across the Midwest, once those opportunities are lost, you don't get them back. It's very hard to, to um, build trail connections in an area that's been platted and, um, and already developed. So uh, think about, about that as you consider uh, the sale of this land. Um, also, uh, recreational opportunities close to home really matter. You may say you've got some state parks pretty close by, but um, studies have shown that um, if it's something you can, you can reach um, in a few minutes from your home, people tend to be more physically active and use those facilities. And that is what is proposed by the Cooley River Trail System. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yep, come on up. Uh, 
Hello, um, my name is Luke Westerbarth, and uh, I don't recognize anyone here. It's nice to meet you guys. We're, we, we moved to Prescott about five years ago, and we live actually right on Jewel Street. So, you know, selfishly, I don't want you to sell the land to a developer. Um, I love the vision of an educational forest and the trail system. Um, but not to mention the fact that, you know, a couple years ago, uh, we, my wife and I considered selling and relocating. Um, you know, I do have a commute to work uh, to and from every day. Um, but we've since really fallen in love with the community. We love St. Joe's Church. We love everything there is to know about it. And plus the vision that my neighbor uh, shared with me, um, Chad, lives across the street. Um, you know, that kind of that drew us to stay, knowing that we would have this, you know, beautiful opportunity to have trails. And since they put in the trails that are just back here, the amount of traffic we see go past our backyard on a daily basis is just exponential. You know, um, we get to talk with, you know, all kinds of different people that we've never met before in the community and everything else. And um, I just wanted to let you know that as a, as an attractive point to a younger, uh, to a younger family with two kids, my, my, my uh, oldest son will be starting 4K next year. Um, but, you know, that was, a, that was a huge attraction to us that this is going to be part of this, uh, that this is going to be part of the program going forward and that you guys are going to have this as a resource for the kids going forward. So, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Luke. We have time for a few more if anybody wants to come up to be heard. All right, and thank you. I, as as uh, member of the board, I think we, we value the input. I mean, I, I will say that. We value all, everybody's input on, on topics like this. We absolutely take it into consideration when, when, we, when we make decisions. Um, I feel we're very early in the process, but things tend to move at different, different paces around here, depending on what the situation is. So thank you very much for, for your input and board will have some dis discussion later on on this one so uh we'll move on to good news around the district is mckenzie going first or i got who, her who, who could steal mckenzie's thunder <laughs> go ahead um <clears throat> i would say a lot of good news around the district especially with sports i know that they're here to recognize today um, volleyball with regional champions. I know Breck and Schumer at the high school went to cross country state and the girls golf for state champs. So, job girls. Um, kind of up on that slideshow, the members of the NHS had a successful blood, tri blood drive this past fall. Um, I know the one act play is advancing to state in Green Bay for their play skit. Um, students also signed for colleges that they're committing to with athletics. Um, there's a choir concert tomorrow. That's exciting stuff. And then the middle school musical is coming up here. I think it's first weekend in December. And then the high school musical will also get kicked off too. So a lot of fun, new things happening. Outstanding. Thank you very much. And tonight we have, um, with our administrative team, we uh, wanted uh, Andrew Caudill to kind of um, highlight some of the fall activities um, while he approaches and some of the coaches and student athletes are here. Um, did want to thank um, the city council of the Prescott um, area for proclaiming um, last uh, at their board meeting on the 13th of November, um, commending the girls golf team and their coaches for the hard work, dedication, sportsmanship, and talent. Uh, we have that posted up. They were four straight division two champions and two titles uh, has made them a great impact on the school and the community. So a very uh, um, nice touch by our um, city council and just wanted to make sure that that was recognized as well. Andrew. Perfect. Before I turn over the teams, um, Angela McGee sent me this to, to share. As you know, we did a, a pink-out game, at our last home football game, to um, tackle cancer. And our donation to the Randy Shaver Tackle Cancer uh, Group was $3,611, which is pretty good considering it was not the best weather. And we've kind of started a new trend where that group is going to want to get more into western Wisconsin um, to benefit that group, whereas right now they've stayed more in Minnesota. So thanks to Angela McGee and the football program for the work they did on that. So. Starting, starting this month, what I would like to do is at the conclusion of every athletic season and performance season to bring up uh, members of the team to give you a brief uh, summary of their season. And so today is the, the kickoff of that. So we'll go ahead and start off with our football representatives, Mr. Hansen and Mr. Burnick. 
All right, thanks for having us. Uh, Teddy Burnick, played quarterback for us, tremendous player, uh, one of our team captains. Um, set the school record in passing this year as well. He's an all-conference kid, a uh, great leader for us. He's going to kind of kick off the recap of our season, and then I'll finish it off. Um, we went four and five overall this year, but um, we won both non-conference games for the first time since 2017. And um, in our first game, we shut out Regis and gave them their first loss in the regular season um, in the last five years. And um, we were voted team of the week for week one. And then um, after week three, we were ranked seventh in the state. And um, we had six players get all conference and our safety bear Temmers was nominated as, a, was nominated as all region. And then um, our offense set school records for um, most passing yards in the season, over 2,000 yards, and we are looking forward to a great next season, or a great season next year. Um, yeah, besides, you know, we, we kind of set a goal to, to make the playoffs, and we didn't quite meet that goal, you know, talking with, with all these guys, and, and sometimes that's okay. It's okay to fail in life for such an instant gratification. Um, but we had a small senior class. We had a lot of these guys, uh, juniors, coming back. And we're super excited for next year and, and the learning process of, of what we need to do to get better. Um, but we, we started off the year, like Teddy said, strong. Uh, I think it comes from um, you guys allowing us to, to do what we were able to do, go down to Holman for two days and, and camp out with them. They're, they're a school of 12,000 kids. And we get to go down there and compete, and we did a phenomenal job. And, and um, I think that's a big reason why we've started out so strong these last few years, to be able to do that, do, the, uh, do those kinds of things. Um, you know, our middle board conference is, is probably the best football conference our school size in in, uh, in the state. In the last 10 years, you have, you know, Somerset, St. Croix Central, Ellsworth, Osceola, and now Rice Lake this year. Five different teams have been in the state finals. Um, so we knew it was going to be a grind. You know, we, we've made strides every year to, to get this thing going and, and keep getting better. And these guys work their butt off. Um, and we're excited for, for what, uh, you know, what's to come and to keep climbing that ladder. Uh, our participation numbers went up, you know, for the first few years here, we've had about 50 kids. This year we went to up to 65, and then with a small senior class, you know, we expect to be over 70 kids next year. Um, and then the last thing is, is our weight room numbers and what Coach, uh, I know Brent Jamison isn't here tonight, but what he's been able to do for all of our programs is tremendous. Last week, um, just I took a video in there, if you see it on Twitter or whatever, it's got like 4,000, 5,000 views. Uh, we had 70 kids in the weight room and they're all working, and they're all getting after it. And I've never seen that since I've been here in the work that he's putting in. Tonight we had over 100 athletes go through with wrestling, girls basketball, boys basketball, out of season kids as well. Um, so I just wanted to highlight you know, things he's doing for, for all our programs as well. So great season, we, did, we didn't quite meet our goal. Um, you know, we look forward to, to climbing that ladder and uh, setting a goal next year and trying to meet it. So thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you also to uh, Coach Hanson. Um, kind of kudos to the community service that you also had your football team do this fall. As we were switching buildings, a lot of furniture needed to be moved. Not only did he volunteer part of the football team, but he was the first one coming off the truck as well. So um, he definitely leads by example and truly appreciate that. So thank you. Next up, we have our girls volleyball team representing B. Reese Patak and Auburn Enega. Hello. So overall, er, season was very successful. We had um, went into the season 33 and 10, which was um, very good for. I mean, um, for me, ending as a senior, ending on a very good note, that was amazing. Um, we won conference for the first time in eight years since um, 2015 was the last time we won, and that was awesome. Yeah. I mean, being 7-1 in conference, I mean, that was awesome for me, again, as a senior, finishing out strong. Our only loss was to um, St. Croix Central, which that was a tough loss, but I feel like that was a loss that really pushed us in the um, um, end of the season to keep getting better and keep working harder. Um, so, yeah, we ended season 33-10, and 10, which that was just really I would awesome. say, too, that at the beginning, every single one of us, uh, I was told that our goal was to win conference, and we accomplished that right away, which was really cool and then as a bonus we won um, regionals so yeah winning, regi winning regionals for the first time in 40 years that yeah, was definitely like like I said winning conference was like my goal and then winning regionals was like the cherry on top like that just really made my final season like so awesome for me.
Um, yeah, we ended the season. We had three conference players. Katressa Severson, who reached um, a milestone for the program with 1,600 assists. First one to ever reach 1,000. Um, Lila Postuma made all-conference, and then I also made all-conference. Um, and yeah, I mean, overall, just an amazing season. Great group of girls. We really were, it was really fun getting to play with everyone. And um, I mean, huge thanks to Tracy and the coaching staff for everything they've done for us. And um, and Mr. Kyle, thank you. Uh, but yeah. And Reese, what's next? Next is Kansas. Um, my last day of school is December 1st, and then I leave around January 10th. So, yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, girls. All right. I'll introduce uh, Coach Soleil and uh, his crew. <coughs> Miss Rolls coming from the back. And we got Miss Farron and uh, Gabby Matzik. I didn't realize I was going to come out of here with some homework. How many golf holes can I fit on a 14 acre parcel? Special, this is a great opportunity. Um, you know, I feel like one of those, you know, it's at our banquet recently, we were able to just thank everyone that was there parents, athletes, obviously, um, and just, you know, it, it does take for to accomplish great things it does take a lot of people and you guys are a big part of that community is a big part of that um, so I'm glad that we have this opportunity to thank some people so I want to take take a minute here to thank first of all the school board members here um, your support for our program is so much appreciated uh, many of you guys follow along on our social medias um, Mr. Spacuza is a Twitter expert. Um, Tanya is super active on Facebook, and I think we got to get Mike Matzik on that uh, Instagram. Maybe we'll get him. To <laughs> so um, you know, I know I know our families and our coaching staff, the girls, um, all appreciate that. They know that you guys are following along and and you know doing all that stuff. So that you know, much appreciated. And, and we obviously know that you guys support us in so many other ways. So thank you guys, uh, staff, the staff here at. at Prescott, um, you know, golf's a sport where um, it's played, you know, in the light of day. So our girls often have to leave school a little bit early. Um, so with that, you know, to get there to warm up and prepare, they're, they're uh, missing some classes from time to time. Uh, staff and administration has been nothing but supportive for our players. Um, you know, their, their willingness and um, flexibility to kind of help our, our girls out. Um, understanding that co-curriculars are an extremely important aspect of uh, many of the students' uh, high school experiences is, is phenomenal, so we appreciate them. And then lastly, of course, AC, um, for all the stuff that he does for us uh, behind the scenes. Um, I just want a quick story about AC. You know, the first, <laughs> first month being employed here, I kind of to break the news to him that he was going to be the starter for our regional event. <laughs> and he's like, Coach, I've only golfed like a handful of times in my life. <laughs> and so, you know, this year he's, he's an expert. He's, he, he was a starter for our sectional. He's, he's got his script down. He's kind of even, you know, he's, he's like an air traffic controller. He's like, Coach, I'm three minutes ahead of time. We're, we're on time. We're, everything's going well. So kudos to him for, uh, for, for uh, you know, just learning the ropes and, and becoming a, an expert there on the golf side. So uh, just a few, I want to run down a few highlights. Um, JV had an undefeated conference season, winning the NBC for the fifth straight year. Um, and just kind of a side note about them, because they're kind of a special group. Um, in, you know, in two of our, it, golf's kind of a unique sport where you can play um, some JV teams if they're capable and they're of that caliber in varsity events. And in the two varsity events that they played, they beat the following varsity teams. And some of these teams are some of the biggest schools in the state. Stevens Point, Wausau West, on Alaska, Marshfield, Wisconsin Rapids, Holman, Menominee, Aquinas, who missed D2 <coughs> State by one stroke, Reedsburg, GET, Sparta, S, uh, St. Croix Falls, Ellsworth, Barron, Osceola, Baldwin, and Somerset. So um, just kind of a phenomenal group of girls that uh, just makes our team so deep. And, and you know, we always say it, it, the toughest competition that our girls see is at practice. Um, we, have, we have some of the best players in the state top to bottom on our team and, and it's it's unbelievable. So um, some notable things with our varsity squad this year, we had six all-conference selections, four all-state honorable mention selections. Uh, our varsity won the middle border conference championship for the fourth straight year. Uh, we won the regional for the fifth straight year. Uh, we won the sectional for the fifth straight year and uh, we won our fourth straight state championship. 
Uh, again, in exciting fashion, a little too exciting for me. I don't know how many more years I can do this. Um, but becoming only the fourth team in the 52 year history of girls golf to do so, joining Madison West from the 70s, Lacrosse Central from the 90s, and Madison Edgewood from the 2000s. Uh, and we also become the first and only Middle Border Conference team in any sport to win four straight championships. So um, just kudos to these girls, and I want to introduce them quick here. Um, this is Lydia Farron, Gabby Matzik, and Jeannie Roll. And in addition to their phenomenal golf ability, they were all also uh, all state academic. So um, with with our group, we have some phenomenal golfers, but we also have some phenomenal students. And so thank you, guys. Thank you, you guys. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Leave you with the cliffhanger. Uh, Coach Phillips came down with a, a bug today, so he asked cross country to come back in December. So they'll be back in December, and we'll invite one act to talk about their performance season in December as well. So thank you. Thanks, Andrew. <coughs> Administrative team, do we have, or are we covered? All right. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. <laughs> Michael Kosmalski. All right. I've got one I need to cover for intermediate school. Um, on November 4th, we had about 100 students from four different school districts here for Destination Imagination. Um, and we had two teams from the intermediate school, a fifth grade and fourth grade team that um, our fifth grade team won a white ribbon for their performance, uh, the Bremen Town Musicians, and that was Joseph Swanson, Isabel Robertson, Penelope Henniger, Lucy Gruntner, and Lila Montreal. And that was uh, parent volunteer coach Jackie Montreal that led that group. And then our fourth grade team um, had a red ribbon performance, the care and feeding of a dragon. It, uh, the students were Jillian Kunabaki, Alpha Justin, Dana, Danny Nelson, Aspen Whitcomb, Regan Martin, Jessica Overland, Sierra Johnson, and Sophie Urbano. And they were coached by another parent volunteer, Veronica Justin. And I want to thank um, the parent volunteers for putting that on and helping our students through that, because without our volunteers, we would not have that experience for our kiddos. Um, we're also nearing the end of our book, Rump. I wanted to thank our guest readers, Dr. Spicuza, and a uh, late ad of Mr. Figgy. I uh, had a late night assignment the one night. Um, and I just want to thank our MPC um, uh, committee for having the experience of the author coming to our school later on this month. And they'll spend the entire day with our students, um, including lunch um, that some of our students are going to um, earn. We've been having trivia going on, and we're going to draw names out of the bin on Monday. And on Wednesday, they get to have lunch with the author of our book. And it's just creating a lot of buzz. And I just want to thank um, Alexis Magnino, one of our fifth grade teachers, for bringing that program to our, to our attention and to our school. Thank you, Michael. Sarah Dusick, Malone Elementary. My good news is brought to um, you by the support of the Malone Parent Committee. Um, they have got quite a few things going on at the elementary and inter intermediate school in the month of um, November and December. Um, next week, we have our annual turkey bingo, which is a favorite of staff and students. So if you don't have anything going on at 2 o'clock on Tuesday, you can come and join us and gobble in the hallways um, for turkey bingo. Um, they're also preparing for their holiday shopping spree um, and are always looking for volunteers for that. If you want to sign up for that, there's um, a link on the Malone Parent Committee website, on uh, the district website. And then at Malone Elementary, they... Um, sponsored an active kindness program that will be coming to us for a school-wide kindness um, program like retreat um, on December 14th. So. Mr. Good evening, members of the board. Kyle Lango, middle school principal. I have just two very quick things. My first one is we ended our first quarter two weeks ago. Um, and at the end of each quarter, we do a, a little bit of a, a end of quarter celebrations to celebrate our, our hard work and our academics and a variety of other things. Mr. Kosmowski is going to share some things about academics in, in a little bit, so I'm going to skip that. But on the way back from our celebration at Grand Slam, 
um, before our, our students even got back, um, the managers at Grand Slam called um, to talk to us about how great our student body was, how great our staff is, and I, I think the Prescott community needs to know that our middle school students and, and really all of our students have been representing our community in, in the most positive way that they possibly can. Um, the manager at Grand Slam said we are by far the best middle school middle school group that comes through. Um, I think it's our third year going there um, and they, they hope that we continue to, to go back each and every year. Uh, my second bit of good news is just to put a little plug in for our musical Willy Wonka coming up on December um, 8th, 9th, and 10th. If you have not gotten your tickets yet, please do so. You can find the uh, QR code on the Prescott School District webpage um, to, to purchase your tickets. So we look forward to seeing everyone there. Thank you. Good evening, members of the board. Sandy Strand, Director of Student Services. Uh, we've been very busy, um, obviously, um, always busy in student services with special education and EL and counseling. Um, I did notice in the slides that um, uh, in honor of School Psychology Week, we actually are missing one of our psychologists, Andy Cohen, but if you look at the rest of the slides, I believe he's the one on the cot giving blood <laughs> in the blood drive, so is he is featured in the slideshow, <laughs> so wanted to throw some props out to Andy. Um, really excited, yesterday, um, I was able to attend a training at CESA um, with two elementary teachers and our counselor um, for the elementaries. And it was an excellent training called Promoting Self-Control in Young Children. Um, as many of you and many of our community members know, we're seeing more and more behavior in our young kids and more and more referrals for services. And what was so great is the training had just so many practical strategies that our elementary staff are really excited to have some conversations around um, what tier one guarantees can we create for social emotional well-being for our students and um, promote uh, that self-control in those youngsters who are just struggling with it. So that's my good news. Thanks. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. Mr. Montreal. Good evening, board. Um, a few things Mackenzie didn't touch on. I have, I would call them quick hitters tonight from the high school. Uh, number one is that uh, this week, and I think there's a slide, oh, good timing. This week is National Apprenticeship Week. Uh, we have eight PHS students who are active in that program, which provides opportunities for students to learn academic and workplace skills that may lead to post-secondary education pursuits and or careers. Uh, the second item I want to talk about or mention is we have a new Spanish club at the high school. Uh, currently has 13 members and counting, and their mission is to explore Spanish culture, language, and traditions in order to increase their overall knowledge. And lastly, we held our Veterans Day Assembly this past Friday in our gymnasium. It's a guess, I think we roughly had about 800 people, including the middle school, high school, and community members. Uh, we attempted to celebrate and recognize the importance and meaning of Veterans Day while honoring all veterans. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Um, I have three uh, important things just to kind of share. I wanted to first um, be very thankful for the Berg family. Um, Brian Berg is an individual who has um, written to us and Mr. Matzik as the president of the school board that he is creating a scholarship uh, in the name of uh, their family and it'll go to begin um, for the graduating class of 2024. It'll be to go to the University of Wisconsin Platteville It'll start at $1,000 per year. As the endowment grows, they'll be looking at increasing that by $500 increments. Um, very happy for the support of that family and um, couldn't uh, be more appreciative of this opportunity for financial assistance to graduates of the Prescott High School. In addition, um, as you look up on the slide, you saw um, that uh, we were uh, 
received uh, a check for $1,500. This is based on uh, debit cards that um, individuals have with the uh, with uh, First National Bank River Falls. We had a photo op with Jeff Johnson. Um, Chad was there as well. Um, Lisa Nelson, and I'm forgetting who the fourth person was. Chad? Scott Murphy. Scott Murphy. Okay. Um, so uh, that is based on anybody that has an account with them. They also have um, the opportunity to kind of um, put the uh, different emblems of Prescott Pride on their debit cards and that additional money is then gifted to the district for its Sunshine Fund where we um, can um, provide either uh, support for staff that lose somebody or for certain celebrations. So it's nice to have community members and businesses part participating in that way. I also wanted to just recognize Nicole Lenzner. She is our food service director. Um, over the last month she has been busy, busy engaged in statewide and CESA 11 uh, food service networks. Uh, the Prescott High School hosted um, multiple districts uh, to go through food safety and different um, <coughs> opportunities of how uh, school lunches and breakfasts can be uh, provided. That training brought in a lot of uh, different staff from across the state and we were very appreciative of Nicole's leadership. She is also uh, putting her hat in the ring for sitting on one of the boards. So um, again, the outreach of the staff uh, goes up uh, above and beyond just what they provide on a daily basis for the Prescott Public Schools. And then finally to our staff, to the board and to our community, I just wanted to wish everybody um, a happy Thanksgiving as we have an opportunity to be very grateful for the many things that our community and school district have been provided. All right, thanks everyone. We'll get down to business here. First item is the consent agenda. In the consent is as follows. October 18th, regular board minutes, board checks and finance, non-licensed personnel hires, resignations, and retirements of non-licensed staff. Alice training reports, accepting the NEOLA technical updates and changes, version 32.2. .2. And I think that was it. I gotta make sure I got it all. Yes. Is there anything in the consent that the board would like to pull out? All right, I will adopt the consent agenda as presented. Are there any objections? All right, consent agenda is adopted. Thank you. We'll move on to and item. Can I just uh, point out because it's not a non-licensed person, but um, as you know, that we had an opening for our HR generalists and benefits specialists. Kalen Boach uh, is the individual that you um, have um, awarded uh, the new position, and he'll begin on Monday, November twentieth. We look forward to Kalen joining us. Yeah, thank you for pointing that yeah. out. All right, we'll move on to item B. Consider actions after consent agenda, after consent agenda, hires, resignations, and retirements of licensed staff. No hires, Rick? Uh, none at this time. Resignations? We do. We have our uh, one resignation, Lauren Burks, who serves as our occupational therapist and provides assistance for students with uh, special needs. Anybody have any questions on this one, comments? No. Okay, we'll take a motion here. I'll move to approve uh, all resignations. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And that carries, and item three is retirements, which we have no retirements, Rick? Correct. All right, we'll move on. Item C is consider first reading of the updated new board policies. <coughs> so I figure we'll kind of tackle these one at a time. Not, it, we'll, we'll, we'll go through them one at a time, ask questions, and then have a vote at the end. Um, so Two rather than go through all uh, 10 of these, um, obviously they're linked, we can pull them up if you would like. Um, just to make sure, the first one is about public expression by the school board. As you know, you follow a governance model. You also follow a board of, uh, board of the whole. And in this, uh, it basically um, identifies that the president is the individual that speaks on behalf or um, engages the community on behalf of the school board of Prescott. Yeah, and that, uh, the only changes in here really to me were calling out statements to individuals that you still represent the board unless you 
you know, so I guess choose not, you know, to just make sure it's your individual opinion. Mm -hmm. Anybody have any questions on this one? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, the second one is just about uh, it's related to staff discipline. It includes both licensed and non-licensed staff. Uh, it does talk about the investigation of criminal activity with employees. Um, it does specifically just call out that the Garrity warning is something that is uh, recommended by Neola and also our district council. It basically just identifies that the individual has the right to um, uh, that the information that they give to us, that we have the right to investigate, the information that we gather would not be used for criminal um, activity, uh, but it's something that we would put in place um, to basically make sure that they understand kind of what their rights are. But failure to participate also leaves the district with the ability to um, make a decision based on the information that they have. Anybody have any comments or questions on this one? Any changes? <laughs> We'll just keep ripping through them, and if you have any questions, just jump in. Uh, the third one is with regards to open enrollment. Open enrollment um, has a specific window, but then, as you all know, the window then reopens, um, and individuals that are not uh, living within the district boundaries are able to um, reach out and identify whether or not they can participate. Each January, the school board does have the right to open or close certain areas. A lot of times, historically, we've closed sections related to special education because we don't have the personnel to provide that or those services. What this is really uh, talking about is just adding additional words, such as may, um, uh, about whether or not we would ever open, allow enrollment of an expelled student from another district and that basically is the insertion of may doesn't mean that we have to but it also doesn't preclude a student that might have been expelled elsewhere to be enrolled in the prescott public schools or is currently under an order i think that was the language currently under an order of expulsion mm -hmm. that was added anybody have any any questions on this one or comments nope no. all right um, as you know, we uh, are required and there is compulsory um, attendance. Uh, principals have assisted. I uh, wanted to thank um, the administrative team. They meet on Thursdays. Uh, what they did is reached out to the county and what they did is took Neola's policy and then aligned it with the truancy reports and the categories so that the wording aligns with Pierce County. Um, and it just, I think, will um, follow a little bit easy, uh, easier so that we align kind of what's excused, unexcused, the number of days that students can be absent, up to 10, but it also dictates when letters go home, and uh, that clears up, I think, some of the confusion that often happens. I actually did have a question on this one. Okay. Um, I think two. One, so I was just, because, um, anyways, uh, there are some exceptions to when a student needs to be in school, compulsory compulsory education that you talked about. Um, it also doesn't reference, so it goes to age 18 is the thing. It doesn't reference when a student graduates, and we've had a few students graduate earlier in the year. Mm -hmm. um, and so can we add something? Like, I was kind of reading and thinking that should be in there, but if a student meets the graduation requirements, regardless of age, um, they're not compelled to be at school. But that, I didn't see a space in there that said that. Okay. Yeah, I th um, be happy to, we can figure out where in the paragraph that would basically just specify that unless, you know, because it does say all children in that second paragraph between yep. the ages of six and 18 mm -hmm. um, have to be in full time. And I guess we could add something to the degree unless they've uh, graduated. Because that last sentence has the exceptions, mm -hmm. but it doesn't include uh, meeting graduation requirements. Then my second question on here, um, and it says it in some spa um, spaces where it's written or oral notification stating the absence and the reason. Mm -hmm. What does the county say with that? Because some places oral is crossed off and some places it's still on there. Yeah, we um, basically, I don't think the county has any um, regulation on that. Um, it was more internally that we took away the oral um, on some of them when there were excused absences for a longer period of time. 
Um, it, one of those things is that it's harder for us to keep track um, in the number of days and the number of students, the number of phone calls that are coming in. It's easier for us to just have a paper trail that families would have a written note um, for us so that we have that documentation. And then um, it says a student may be excused in writing by their parent before the absence. Um, and then it gives kind of reasons and stuff. So I'm looking at part C there, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when it talks about, and I'm asking because I actually had this experience, but um, when a student is at medical, medical visits and all that kind of stuff, um, do they need doctor's notes? Because I did not see that in here. And I think like we literally go to, when we ask that from the doctor, they're like, you must be from Prescott. You're the only district. And I'm just wondering, do we need to do that? Because I defer to my I don't see it in here. And I just want to make sure, like policy wise, like I don't want to add more to our plate for verification if we don't need to. We can trust our parents with some so of that stuff. This, this is where a lot of the confusion comes in. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Spicuza, I know the administrative team, we gave you part of of the um, truancy policy from Pierce County yeah. because it does talk, I think, about in letter G towards the bottom how each you will come up with a truancy plan. Mm -hmm. And what we are adding is because that is what is the confusing part is that parents in Infinite Campus, they give us yep. a note, it's marked as excused. Right. But the county defines it as um, being exempt. And what is exempt? And we can only take exempt if we have a note from a medical provider, not a parent calling in and saying, my kid is sick. So there is a list of what is considered exemptions, and it's part of this part to insert following plan G, and before the notice of truancy, this is directly from Pierce County, so that way it hopefully clears things up, because part of that, a lot of that other stuff is coming from state statute, which then says, and rely on your county plan. Here's our county plan, to just to put it in writing so it's more visible to our families. Because that's typically what the question is, is that, well, Infinite Campus says these are excused absences. Correct, but they aren't a legal excuse. And if they are a legal excuse, they would be marked as exempt absences. So that is why administrative team is asking that this part be added so it is clearer to parents that this is part of that truancy plan. And I just, well, truancy plan's one thing, excuse absences is another thing. So I just want to make sure that this is following, like having to have a doctor's note every time you go to the doctor for one hour. That's the That's part of the of county excuse. requires that. Yes, the county would okay, require Okay, that's what I was asking. Yeah. All right. So do and we, Courtney, just uh, on the first one, you yeah. did you take notes? Because we'll add that for the second reading with regards to uh, graduation. Okay. And then this one is part of what's being proposed. It's hyperlinked into um, and follows item G, but before the notice of truancy on page three. Right. Any other questions or comments here? Mm -mm. Okay. Which one are we on here? Five. Academic honesty. Yeah. My strong suit. <laughs> so, um, basically, it is um, that we have added artificial intelligence has been added to this, and then it also cross references another uh, <coughs> policy that is specific about IT and um, artificial intelligence. Yeah. Anybody else have anybody have any questions? I did not. No. No that one kind of refers us to another policy, right? Yep. Is there a point of having that policy? Um, of this one? Because it kind of just yes. refers us to another one. Number nine. Yeah. So that's the artificial one. Okay. And it's more, that one's just then embedded all about um, programming and technology. Okay. So we're on number six, student anti-harassment. Yeah. So it just uh, adds a little bit about witnesses and employee involvement during investigation. Um, You're still linked up there as a... Oh, got it. Right. Uh, recant so we get back on the same page. Hold on. Student anti-harassment, any questions on that? 
Yeah, I had a question. My only question was um, at the bottom of this policy, there's quite a few names that have been crossed out. Is there a way just to use the position versus the name? So then you're not continuously, because then this policy would still fall under that position, whether that name changed or stayed the same. Um, yeah. Because the um, history is showing that it, it changes. Yes, it does change. Um, unfortunately, we did ask that question, and um, the federal guidelines do specify that you have to have an exact specific name and that you also have it on your website. So in that, um, that's why we needed to have those versus um, just the role. And Courtney, you met with um, Neola to kind of clarify that as well, because I was kind of leaning the same way. But, yeah, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> So it's pretty much this is a policy that could essentially every year have an edit or a change to it if we... Yeah, although uh, in this case it would be, there's some changes that were here, but right. this is also something that would be a technical change. It so would just come up to you well, as that's a... that's what I was wondering. Okay. So then if there weren't any other changes, then this would just be one of those technical changes mm -hmm. that we would okay. approve Correct. with consent. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> All right, next one, Rick. Seven? Oh, stale checks. Uh, everybody's favorite thing. Um, this is re basically when we send out checks uh, to a lot of our referees, coaches, every once in a while they get lost in a drawer. They don't cash them, kind of like my nephew and the 12 <laughs> checks that he just tried to cash for his birthday. Um, but uh, one of the things basically is we cannot keep that money. We do have to turn it over by law. And so um, basically we're specifying that it's 180 days. Um, if that becomes a stale check, we have to make um, three attempts to find the current uh, uh, address and complete that transaction. Otherwise, that money is turned over to the state uh, for unclaimed property. Uh, we are moving to electronic payment for all of our referees and um, want to thank AC and the finance office for doing that. It'll make uh, some of this uh, less of a burden. Then um, the next one is about uh, community service. It is a new policy. It's on Fund 80, but it's basically every single thing that we do and everything that we've talked about. Um, and specifically, the main thing it does point out is that you can't cross-subsidize community education. So the events that happen there, it is like its own business, just like, and um, the difference between food service and special education is we cross subsidize those if they go negative. Community education has its own levy and so it is something that has to run um, in the black and can never go in the red. I had a question on this one. So how, how is Fund 80 now different than 81 and 82? So 80 is just the broad and then we break it out because not everybody has a community rec but we do so that's just okay. 81, 82. So it's just you divide up by the number of um, basically community service programs that you offer. Do we anticipate Fund 80 having having a budget and a balance or, so I'm still, so it does why have do we a, have the fund? Yeah, so, so it, this is how um, Penny and PCR are funded. Yep. So they break up the funding that we get on an annual basis and then they also charge fees and that covers their salaries and also the program. And maybe I'm just missing it, aren't they in 80? 81 and 82 though? Yeah, so fun 80 is the subordinate and then okay. it's just meaning so anything under the 80s is captured. All right. So we just never had something that specifically spelled out what fund 80 was? Correct. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's why I was confused. <clears throat> All right. All right. Next one is um, artificial intelligence. It is something that our um, teaching and learning and administrative team reviewed. Um, they're supportive of it. Um, and I don't know if we had any questions. And then the last one, um, Ms. Courtney has been working on this uh, for a long time. It is something that uh, changed. But basically, after next month, every uh, public entity has to submit a report to the, is it to the Historical Society, right? <laughs> About what our retention records are. Um, there are, for every single business, from HR to finance to um, personnel records to 
voting records, yada, yada, yada. Um, all of them have different timelines or uh, of retention. We are recommending that the Prescott Public Schools um, uh, select seven years, which is one kind of a superordinate that would cover all retention records that don't have legal requirements elsewhere, because sometimes the same document will have different legal public record requirements. Typically, it is in finance and it's around bonds, because the bonds usually last more than seven years. So basically, um, our recommendation is to have a seven-year record retention process. Anybody have any questions or comments on this one? Mm -hmm. nope. All right, so that's all of them. We had the one change that was recommended by Tanya for the attendance policy number graduation. four, right? Yep, yeah. number four will add uh, as long as they have not yeah. officially graduated. So this is just the first reading and this is just a, a mo we just need a motion to accept the first reading. We'll come back next month with a change and if it looks good, we'll approve it. All of them, right? Correct. So, if there's no questions, we can take a motion here. I move to accept the first reading of the above noted policies with or without um, the edits that were presented for consideration. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. And item D, the early college credit program in Star College now. I'll have uh, Mr. Figgy, and it's my error. Um, I know that we've talked about this moving to consent, um, and we continue to go back to the prototype. Uh, and um, so Courtney has added that in the future, the early college and Star College now will go to consent. But um, you, I did want to call out that you received the packets earlier. Um, there was a specific change and we've added additional students, so we did want to make sure that you understood when we add additional students, there's additional costs. Um, but I'll let Mr. Figgy clarify that. Excellent. First time you guys are hearing about this program. <laughs> so give me a half hour so I can go through each. No, uh, it's two great programs the state of Wisconsin provides. Um, they're essentially very similar. ECCP stands for Early College Credit Program. Star College now um, allows students to take collegiate courses at a technical college. Um, ECCP allows them to take college credits at a four-year university. Um, so they do very similar things. Really the only difference is how they are funded by the state, um, whether we get reimbursements, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we have five students who are looking to take courses uh, through ECCP um, and because of our growing partnership um, and the growing campus and the opportunities that are taking place um, both via our ITV program through uh, technical schools across the state but also through CBTC, CBTC in River Falls we have um, about 23 students who are looking to take start college now classes um, and it ranges from a number of different things, from uh, enhancing their English, to sciences, to business, to social studies, um, to some certification courses like EMT. We have a few students taking EMT courses, healthcare courses, et cetera. Um, so it's, it's grown fairly robust over the past uh, seven years. I think when I first started, we had maybe one or two students who were taking courses. Um, and this is, I think, kind of the nature of, of what a lot of um, high schools are going to in their junior and senior year. So uh, there are quite a few opportunities through this program. Um, it is a rather um, straightforward set of criteria. Schools um, are required by state statute to consider um, students to have up to 18 credits through these programs. Uh, students, there, are, there can be no criteria on students set by the school district, so you can't set a, a behavior criteria or a, um, a GPA criteria or anything like that. Um, the one criteria that a school district can impose is you can look at the program, program courses that you offer and if you offer it, the same course on site then you can deny a student um, if, they have, if they've taken that course on site, if they can take that course on site. Um, but a lot of things have to line up. So after I review these, I bring these to you. Um, 
I will note it is a rather uh, expensive program, as you can see. Um, but one of the things that a lot of our students are starting to explore, which I've tried to denote with some asterisks in there, um, is that we do get money back, not only reimbursed from the state in a um, reduced rate on tuition, but after the fact, at the end of the year, I fill out what's called the um, CTE incentive grant, Career and Technical Education Incentive Grant. And so, for example, our, our students who are taking EMT, when they earn their certification, we get $1,000 back as a district for each student. So it actually helps offset the cost of all these courses. It's just not visible on this, the spreadsheet or the table. So more than happy to take questions. Anybody have any questions here? Okay, so I know I've heard this a thousand times. Um, is the, how different is this than getting an articulated credit? So uh, the difference, most of our articulated credits yep. or our transcriptive credit classes take place um, with our teachers on site. Yep. And in that case, you cannot access this program. Um, so, we, but we get. And we there's get still college credits. Yeah. Yeah, there's still college credits. We get them free because we're providing the instructor. In these cases, um, it's a it's an outside instructor. Students are taking it via an external force. And then, do we look at like I I counted like maybe seven or eight kids that took a psychology course so then do we look at like how do we um, incentivize one of our teachers to get um, like trained in order to teach psychology here I, I, I mean there's a cost savings to us as well as it seems like our kids are really interested in it yep I, I would agree um, probably should two two things that we've started to see I think last year we had a lot of students who were taking kind of that college psychology like mm -hmm. it's like 150 um, and now you're going to see a lot of our students are actually taking a psychology too. Too, I saw that, yeah. Um, and getting so it's a lot of these when I reviewed them, they were kids who have taken our on-site psychology, or they took psychology. Mm -hmm. CBTC. Now they're moving on to that next mm -hmm. level. So um, definitely something we're looking at because I think in the last three years, uh, mm -hmm. psych has been one of the most mm -hmm. popular offerings. Anybody else have any questions? Mm -hmm. So we, I know that we've. We have and, and, and do still support this program. Uh, we are within policy on all these students. Correct. Rick, from a budgetary standpoint, are we uh, looking at the, let's call it nine <coughs> plus three, let's call it, what is that, about 15? Mm -hmm. Are we within the ballpark, the, the, the order of magnitude that is budgeted? this year we're within the ballpark um, also we are um, basically they are programs that we have to provide so um, to Tanya's point that's where at some point you have to start to look at do you incentivize staff or run programs because these are classes that we do not have available within our school system so but uh, the 15,000 with regards to also some of the uh, refunds now again not all every class gets a refund that's the asterisk piece but it's within uh, budgetary parameters of what we have all right and and it seems like every time we talk about this and I know Tanya and I probably ask questions every time this comes up mm -hmm. we, we do this twice a year is that when we when we have these enroll enrollments yeah well in in the ideal form we do it only twice a year yeah because we haven't had anybody who accesses these over the summer right um, unfortunately with kind of the trickle in nature of some of our students courses sometimes it ends up especially in the spring where we get mm -hmm. one crop and then we get another crop so our, our counseling office is trying to tighten that up which is why some of these were in about a month ago before mm -hmm. October 1st and I just held them all until you know, we're kind of we're kind of at a tight that deadline here, but I wanted to not do this in October or sure. November and December. Mm -hmm. and well, so now you don't have to. It's just on the consent <laughs> agenda. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the program continues to grow. So that's something budgetarily we need to look at. Help me understand. I don't remember this. So, so we have a policy, right? That 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 allows this, mm -hmm. um, but there's also state statute that requires it. I, maybe first time I'm. Yep. Maybe not hearing it, maybe understanding it. Our, our policy is written in conjunction with, with the state statute. statute. Yep. Okay, so despite cost, we have to figure out a so, way. Okay, all right, thank you. Yep. And is it it's a good clarification, though. Wasn't, I believe, maybe I'm thinking of this wrong, but wasn't there a credit limit, though, that kids could take? So it's there 18, is some. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, 18 credits, and that's the yeah. state sets that out. They give uh, any local entity the ability to go above and beyond that. Um, so I would say a lot of districts are going this way. Some of the people I've talked to are navigating around by saying they're offering virtual courses. Mm. 
that are similar. I think it'd be tough with, you know, Psych 2. There's not a Psych 2 in our right. virtual library, EMT. So it's tough to get a true one-to-one -one comparison. Good questions. Anything else? Thanks, Josh. Yep. Can take a, a motion here. I move to approve the high school proposal for the students and courses listed as presented for the ECCP and Start College Now for the spring of 2024 classes. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Thank you. That concludes business. We're on to information discussion. First item is the update on request for proposals to entertain to sell an estimate of 14.6 acres of school district land. Yeah, so um, I have put the request for proposals up on the screen. As you know, um, earlier this summer we had a closed session uh, due to um, an individual uh, had reached out uh, to um, ask whether or not the district would entertain the sale of 14.6 acres. Um, we had a discussion about it um, over the nine years that I've been with the Prescott Public Schools and once this building was um, officially open in 2016, there were still a lot of things that we were trying to put in place, mainly the cross country track um, that historically was over at 1220 St. Croix and uh, ran over uh, by Joy Lutheran, which is now filled in with homes. So um, took us a couple years to get it over and moved, and we were able to have a cross-country uh, track that's um, right behind the ball fields, First National Bank ball fields. And Andrew uh, Caudill has been able to host many different events and even collegiate events on that space. Um, but the board directed me, thought it was um, probably not in our best interest to just take one suitor, and we wanted to identify First, um, we also knew that we were in a budget crunch, and um, that is one of the other items that we'll be talking about. Um, but as you know, we're running nearly a million dollar unbalanced budget where um, our costs far exceed the revenue that's coming in. Um, the property that we have is an asset. It is something that is... Um, beneficial to many different entities, uh, one that's represented here in different uh, varieties. Uh, the school district did pass a resolution. I've had conversations with Israel and also with Freedom Park. Um, I've talked with Matt Wolf, the city uh, manager for the Prescott um, City. I've attended the Chamber of Commerce where there was a wonderful presentation by Ed Lucas and also um, it's Kristen and I think it was Thompson uh, that is part of the um, landmark conservers. How do you pronounce the last one? Conservancy. Conservancy. Now, one of the things, uh, what is, it's called uh, match to the max. And so I know I'll give you a, a call out is that um, there is a purchase agreement for Cooley Pines that would be part of uh, the Cooley River Trail. And I think uh, that they're trying to raise money by December 2024. So 13 months from now, um, I know they have a grant and that they're trying to close uh, on the sale price. I think the total price is a million dollars and they have a $500,000 grant. So um, as a board, I know that you have been interested in and uh, a partner both with the city. Um, one, we own a, a lot of green space and run community uh, rec and youth rec and we know that there are many benefits to the land that is there but also there is a uh, uh, school board um, responsibility to make sure that the best interest of our students and staff is at the forefront um, as you will learn later on the performance uh, the performance of the Prescott Public Schools is non parallel with some of our neighbors, and I think it's something that we should celebrate. But part of that uh, is contingent that we can run programs and have and retain the staff based on a budget um, that allows us to do that. And so um, with the failure of the legislature at the state level to be able to provide us uh, funds that I'll go into later, um, we did put up a proposal. Um, we talked about it in October. It was picked up by the Pierce County Journal. Um, I have met with um, different individuals and you will have um, the bids to review. 
Um, just a reminder that no decision is made in closed session and no decision is being made tonight. Rather, um, we had identified that um, the board would um, help me work with our uh, real estate lawyer to make decisions on the parameters and criteria that would be in place um, if there is a good strike point and whether or not some of the um, areas of concern and partnership that we want to maintain is something that can be part of a sale. It takes two sides to sell, to complete a sale, and so those are some of the things that we'll um, negotiate in the next uh, coming months. So, um, any questions or comments, clarifications from board members? Vicki, you want to, you got any comments or questions here? No, I'm, I think once we, I think, get a little further into this and, and see what we're working with, I think that was our main focus was we needed some idea <clears throat> on what what we're sitting on and, and what what possibilities there are if, if we need to go down the route of selling. So I think we'll find out a little bit more later in our closed session. But, but yeah, I, I'd like to see <clears throat> All of this work out um, we've got options and I think that's what we found out tonight is there's options that the community presented to us and things that we more things that we can explore that we weren't aware of so I think after tonight after we have our discussions and maybe throw in some other things I I'm hoping that we I don't know get a little bit clearer path or whatever I just wait and see all right, Helen? Yeah, I, th I agree. <clears throat> I think, um, first off, I'm glad that everyone came and um, had their opinion and let us know because there's some things I didn't yeah. know either. So I think that conversation will be much deeper now. Um, but yeah, it, we do have a, we've talked many, many, many nights about our fiscal, where we, where we go fiscally from here and our struggles that we're gonna have. So it, Anything's on the table. So. Mackenzie, do you have any comments on this one? No, not at all. Tanya? Um, yeah, I, first of all, I appreciate everybody that came out. And I know, um, you know, there, I, I've worked with the Cooley River Trail. I go on that trail. The, if you haven't gone on the little lighted walks, it's amazing. Um, it's, so, it's an awesome asset to the community, and I, I say all the people involved in it um, are, are great, and they're super active and want what's best for that land. Um, for me, as a board member, um, just my thinking with this is I really feel like I'm at an exploratory area. Um, we were uh, made an offer, um, or like, I, we don't even know the offer, mm -hmm. but like somebody was interested, um, and I felt like, and I think many of us felt like it was fiscally responsible to our community to at least explore what that looks like, especially knowing that we are going under some really big budget cuts or else um, other ways to find that funding. And so this is just one asset that we're holding on to and we're really right now looking at everything just to kind of explore. And I, I think that's the responsible thing to do. Um, uh, I think there's so much benefit when it comes to the school forest land. That's great. I, we have other forest land too, and I don't know how that works together and stuff like that. Um, but but there is benefit to our kids. It is not a buildable or usable, and I think we used that word um, at our last board meeting, and um, Israel, I think you even asked us about that, but um, when I reference usable, like we can't build on it, we can't expand on it, we're not putting a football field or a track on there someday so it's usable in a different sense um, but it is it is a space where we could do education we could do um, all kinds of things which I think was wonderful that that was shared and kind of reaffirmed with us today um, it also though is an opportunity for us to um, maybe recoup some of the money that we might be having to cut from some other place within our school system so it's just important for me to kind of really and it's that hard hat of what I value versus what my role of the school board is and so I, I, I'll put on that hat for the next couple months I assume and really kind of think about um, what what we need to do with the best interest of the school in mind. I also want to say that um, I, I wish the city had more assets like this and I hope that the city can help um, work on, on 
if that's an area that the city values as a park and rec kind of area, which is a city kind of role and not a school district type role, I, I hope that there's some opportunity there that the city can help um, find some ways to use that land or help fund it or pay for it or something like that too. So those are my thoughts. <coughs> I'm not going to repeat everything you said. Um, I want to echo, though, um, fiscal responsibility uh, to at least understand what this means. Mm -hmm. And I do want to echo, I'd be curious to understand uh, what investment in, in something here the city would have. Um, I think that's super important. I don't want to go off script, and, and if we can't, that's fine. Um, I'm sure it's out there somewhere. Maybe you are the right person, Israel, to look into this. I'd be, I'd be, I want to understand um, the the properties that border this property, right? The work has that that has been done. Uh, what has been secured, if anything, or what the you know the hope and the desire is, or or, or maybe even percentage of success of, of making some of these connections, and and um, you know what what piece of this because the trail system may or may not utilize all of it. I don't know, right? But what piece of this, um, if there was some sort of a um, easement or whatever we want to call it uh, would be uh, acceptable or beneficial to Cooley River because I'd like to understand that and I don't know if we probably can't do a show and tell up here right now and point to maps and all that stuff but for me that's going to be important. Um, and Israel, you have shared maps with us, and there's like different colored trails and stuff, and maybe we can kind of find that from prior. I think you even brought up 2021 and stuff like that. So I think I think that part is easy to find. Maybe what I don't know is is where where so Pine Glen right is on the south side of 35. This, of course, is a few properties north on 35. Where when I say we, I meant Cooley River Trails. Where where are we at with? Um, connecting those dots, right? And and I'd, I'd be curious to understand more, so. I think that's a good point. Maybe maybe we can direct Rick to reach out or have Israel and Rick work together to give us the information that you guys are asking for and just disseminate it. And then if we have questions, we can kind of work, either reach out to Israel directly yeah. as an individual board member or through Rick, <coughs> sure, that'd be however great. you want to do it. Yeah. So if, if I might rephrase, maybe what are the what are the what are the high elevation constraints, right? Um, when, as it regards to property, um, and then uh, what is the vision? I guess specifically for this piece is what I'd be curious on. Yeah, Pat, you got any other comments? No, th no thanks. Yeah, I, I, from the sounds of it, at least this is kind of the first time we've really talked about it in open session at this level, at this level of detail. I feel like we're all on the same page. We're trying to be very open-minded here with what we have as far as what decisions are made in front of us. I think for us, I'm gonna echo again what you guys, we, we just, we're, we were just starting this process in my opinion, and in order to um, understand what potential we have with with that with that property uh, financially uh, amongst other things with the with the Cooley River Trail and and other uh, other folks interested in it we we had to get to this point we have to get to this point we have to understand what the value is of that of that property so we can better make more informed decisions I, I think that's uh, that's the bottom line I know we put a we put a date on when we want to receive bids by that date was really to just help accelerate any any requests out there we don't want this dragging on for a year having people submit bids when you know at, at their at their convenience we want it to be at our convenience so we can understand who's interested who the who the players are and the good news is at least for I feel the board is is not only open-minded, but I think there's different ways we can we can attack this or, or go at this. It's not it's not as simple as just we have 14 acres, we're going to sell 14 acres. I think there's different things. There's different levers we can look at, and and maybe you know come up with a uh, a solution that maybe can benefit all parties involved. And that's all I'll say about that. Um, but. We'll we'll learn more a little bit tonight when we when we get to take take a look at the at what bids were submitted, and I think we just go from there. Right? Anybody else have anything before we? Just really quick, we mentioned school forest multiple times, but that might be another thing that we ask to get information on because I know um, it was stated that <laughs> districts around us had school forests, which they do, mm -hmm. but there is 
defi definitely um, writing of grants and staff members that take that on to keep that uh, moving and keeping that um, that kind of dream alive. So that would be another another thing I would be interested more information to come back and how those districts do that and what that would place um, either on our staff member that would take it over or how that would look for a community <coughs> kind of connection. So yeah, I don't so. know if that's something we have to kind of throw back at Jared or if, if someone else wants to reach out to him and see if you can gather. I don't want to put more on Cooley River Trail to do like task things out so maybe somebody within our organization I mean you guys are welcome to too but we have look into it. We have yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 You know like what the definition yeah. is of a school forest requirements all that kind of stuff. Okay. And, yep. Yeah. Yeah. I think we should stick with our typical protocol work through Rick. Yeah. Um, feel free to reach out to individuals that are involved like Israel and others um, on your own time if you want to. Yeah. And we'll just try to disseminate information so the board can can see it in in electronic format and, and we get all that together mm -hmm. um, anything else on that one nope. yeah and again I, I want to thank everybody for getting up and, and um, speaking in the public comment section it does help us um, it gives us more insight and perspective on, on folks and where they're at so I appreciate public comment um, when, when you guys come up and, and actually speak your mind so thank you we'll move on item B is information on the budget and future implications for determining an operational referendum yeah so um, kind of bookended <laughs> right, uh, right. We've kind of alluded to this and we've talked about this since the annual meeting um, as you know we approved a budget with a um, Unbalanced, where the expenses will far uh, will exceed our revenue by nine hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars. The projection grows as you go into uh, fiscal year twenty twenty five to about one point three million. Um, that deficit um, is um, something that we will have better information for you after November 29th. That is a day that. Um, Sue Gertis and Christine Berger, who work in the finance department, may either be participating with Baird um, in Eau Claire uh, to go through kind of the projection models. Um, why does the deficit grow would be one of the first questions people may say. And part of that has to do with that the parameters that you have set uh, in front of Sue and myself to this point is that you have asked that we do nothing in regards to adjusting any of the benefits as well as making sure that we would not freeze salaries so with those two parameters um, we also know that our health care uh, is two million dollars per year um, we have a nine percent cap and that means that it'll add another eighteen thousand dollars into um, our budget um, so we have some constraints that we have to work with and we'll continue to um, come forward with those. Um, but I wanted to kind of just share, um, and I said 18, um, but it's 180,000, so much for decimals. Um, know that our enrollment will be down. So we know that the three year rolling average that will have a decrease in revenue. So this is the high point for revenue. Um, the biennium is already set and that's $325 per student. And that will uh, be eaten up very quickly. Um, what was released earlier today was Ford Analytics. Um, we're posting that article on the district website. Currently within the state of Wisconsin, 82% of all districts are operating under um, a operating referendum. Part of that has to do with the failure of the legislature to continue to fund. And so um, how does that play out for us as a district? Um, <coughs> One of the things that we started to do is look at every area within our budget. And here's an example that I think can help crystallize um, some of the challenges that we're faced with. Um, our current hardware technology budget is $261,000. And it's another $250,000 for software. These are the tools that we have with regards to one-to-one -one Chromebooks, the computer labs, the technology and career and tech ed, as well as the software that we operate. 
that $500,000, right, divided by 1,300 students comes to what? Do you want us quick. To do? <laughs> I wanted you to get your phones out and calculate that for me. Okay, what is it? It's 500,000. Okay. Divided by 1,300. 384 dollars probably and Perfect. 61 cents. Perfect. 384 dollars. Is a concrete example the per pupil increase for this year was how much? 325. Remember that we went one to one when we went to hybrid and closed schools. Those two years when we were getting ESSER dollars, the state chose not to increase any funding for Prescott Public Schools and all public schools within the state. We went to one to one to make sure that we could deliver instruction across time. Later, you're going to hear about the performance of the Prescott Public Schools. Michael did an outstanding job sharing with you about that performance, and it beats the odds. It beats every national, state, local news story that you see on social media and in the newspaper. That is because of the programming and the intentional and strategic decisions that have been made at this board and by your administrative team. The legislature has come back and given us $325 three years in, and we have $325 that will be added next year, when our health care will go up by $180,000. Right? We have made and are looking at flattening out the curve with regards to technology and hardware, and I worked with Andy Holland, um, Josiah, Michael, and... Um, Josh, with regards to taking an audit of all of our hardware across every site. Our teachers participated across every single room in classroom and program and identified all the software that we're using and currently have and identified ones that overlap and we'll start to look at what we can keep. The difference between these two uh, line graphs is what we're projecting out at current costs, and then I added a 3% um, increase for inflation. So somewhere between next year just on hardware is going to cost another $216,000, um, and it could go up to two hundred and twenty-three. dollars And that has to do with every device that we have has a shelf life, and so teacher computers have to be updated, servers have to be updated, Chromebooks have to be updated. Some of the decisions that we've made to date have been to be able to smooth out that curve by doing our rotations in a systematic way as well as leasing uh, the Chromebooks. But those are um, leases that we have and also how our academic model runs. This is part of that um, forward analytic that came out and we shared that report and like I mentioned, we'll put it up for our community to read. But since 2012, remember we're operating since 1993 on a revenue cap uh, um, a revenue cap, and so we are dictated about how much money we can receive. The sum per student um, since that time has increased about 1.2%. As you know, with inflation, um, last year being at near 9%, recently dropping to about 3.8, a 1% uh, um, median district increase per pupil will not cut it. Um, I gave you the example just on one part, technology doesn't cut it for $325. Out of the 392 of the state's 421 districts, the average annual increase has lagged the average inflation. Um, that is why 82% of all districts are currently um, operating with, um, or in need of an operating levy. So. The possible solutions, we do need to have a workshop so that we can go deeper. Um, obviously, we know that you've given me parameters and Sue to work on making sure that benefits and salaries would still be able to be provided. And so that keeps us competitive. We did talk earlier about sale of land. Again, very um, useful property and it can be used in many different uh, facets among different entities and so that was something to be fiscally prudent we wanted to take uh, and look at. We will start to look at programs that we provide and also class sizes um, with regards to some of the targets that we have historically. We're not looking to change them but just to be making sure that we're in a line alignment with those, and then building configurations. Um, some of these are things that we can do in the near future and are more imminent, and some of these things may take a few years to get to. Um, 
obviously we want to make sure that the impact has the least immediate impact on our classrooms and also with regards to our staff. That's our why and that's our performance. So the operating levy, um, it is my recommendation that we would aim for the April um, uh, election. Um, that gives us to January to finalize. And we have a meeting on January 13th. Sue and I would like to come back after the work session um, with a proposed uh, resolution for you to look at and how much. Some of the parameters we'll look at is the tax impact and whether or not there's a breaking point where we can um, ask for an amount that would meet the needs for ongoing operating but not increase the mill rate. And there's some things that we'll talk about with that. Um, it is something that I wanted to share is that our fund balance will not be able to sustain the 1.3. Um, our December payroll will not be able to be made without, um, unless something drastically changes, um, we will have to use our uh, line of credit to make payroll in December. It'll be the first time in over six years. Um, understand that part of this and why a fund balance is necessary is that we are now four months into the school year and the amount of money that we have received from state and local resources is 9%. So we are already past 20, we are 33% of the year into the school year with salaries and expenses and yet we've only received 9% of our revenue. And so that is why uh, the line of credit is so essential. It's a point in time, and that's some of the management that we're doing at this time. Um, we are proposing a work session for Monday, December 4th, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Right? The one thing I needed was just um, if we could set a time. And did you reserve a place, or we still have to reserve a place? Okay. <laughs> Josh, can you see if uh, this room is open on December 4th? Um, and then um, would a 6 o'clock start time be feasible? Or would you need, can anybody go earlier? I can go earlier. Yeah, I think the original thought was 5.30, if we can do that. Uh, if, if that's too early. On the 4th? Mm. On, yeah. on December 4th. Go, I can go even earlier if we wanted to. If we want to go earlier, I can go earlier too. I don't have anything going on. I can. Yep. What would you? What would be? I can be at four thirty. I work till four. There you go. Four thirty works for me. I can take a short lunch and leave early. Not a problem. So I'm here at four thirty is the earliest. But if we don't have to go at four thirty, if you want to go five if, or if we nail the stone today, I can go four thirty. Let's do it. Tanya? Yeah, I can. Let's do it. Let's do it. 4.30. 4.30, I like it. 4.30 to 9? <gasps> no. No. <laughs> no. No, no, no. I do, I do want to put, I want to, I want to put, put a, I want to put a We're back to 6. It, so Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mike, we got to put, we do got to put, we got we to we cap a time on it. And we oh, yeah, we will. It, we will. So we will. No longer, I think we've agreed that never longer than two hours. Yeah. 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 So, Are we going to make No. <laughs> I mean, there's like a level of productivity that happens yeah, when you're no working. Yeah, there's no way three hours so make we, it. Uh, four so it'll be 4.30 to 6.30. Yep. 4.30 So we glad we got that figured out. Was there any comment? Did you have anything else, Rick? Uh, just if there was anything else that I missed about the parameters yeah. you've given to me. Or Pat, do you got any questions or thoughts on this one? Lots of thoughts, but we'll, we'll wait for the workshop. Um, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any? Okay. Go ahead, Tanya. Do you, you no, know? nothing. I. You're asking for direction for them to prep for the yeah, workshop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 What do we want? Um, I, I have a oh, few thoughts, but if you have, if you want to jump in, like, what are you looking for? What kind of information do we want? Well, well, we at our last work session, we asked to kind of, you know, we kind of set some parameters, asked to look a little bit. So I think that that'll be good. Um, <clears throat> I think that's the main thing. We talked about ideas. I think we're really talking about like mill rate and all that stuff would be really handy to come um, with so we can look at tax impact. We t we had a discussion about if we were to have to ask for an operating referendum, when is the best time frames? Do we do two in a row? Do we do one big one? So I think kind of the pros and cons on that stuff I think would be helpful for me. I, Mike, I want to sneak one in. Cause yep. it's a, yes. Uh, one of the things that we have on here, that I think you already mentioned uh, class size, um, would be really important for me to understand. The, the building configuration, um, 
we talk about this a lot, right, as, 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 as potential, we're gonna have to throw a dart at some point in time and pick, pick a value, right? What would it cost to reconfigure and or, I'm just gonna say it, you know, mothball a building? Um, we talk about it all the time. I think we're afraid to give a value to that, but in this exercise, we just have to. It might be wrong, but we have to. So I would be looking for that uh, as well. Ballpark, right? I mean, now we're not talking ballpark, down in but, the weeds, but we, yes. But we got to come up with something, right? To, yep. to say we think it's going to be especially this cost or this cut. <laughs> cut yeah, right. So, you know, yeah, I understood. Anything else? We'll come back if you need. Vicki, any comments or questions here? No, bring snacks. Bring snacks, yep. Jimmy Jens. Helen? I would say the building configuration is a big deal for me. So the building configuration? Like what we can do with that and what that would save or not save. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, Rick, I know we talk about this, but I'm just going to reiterate it again. We got to come up with what that number looks like and so the cuts if there's cuts that need to be proposed we would want to know what those cuts are in december and the parameters i think that the board would like and you guys jump in here um cuts the first cuts would be that don't impact staff retention or academic performance anything that impacts those two things should be considered as I guess a tier two of some sorts, you know, tier one would be like, what can we, what can we reduce out of the budget without impacting those two things? If I'm missing something, jump in, guys. But that's what I would, I would want that kind of tiered out. Um, we talked about like class sizes and stuff. Class sizes. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that kind that of does, that, I mean, that, be, that yep. might be the gray area. Yep, yep. That's, that's part of that. And, that and definitely want to know about class sizes. I, I don't want to get us in a position where, and I think the board, you guys would agree, mm -hmm. where the class sizes just get too big. Right. No. We we at one point we have it somewhere where we had a a board approved recommendation of class size ranges. It's policy. Yep. And not policy. It's not policy, yeah. but, policy. but it was it was board approved <clears throat> ten years ago when we were you know looking at portables or it's been it's longer than that. Jeez. No, we have it. We'll, we can bring that. Forward. I think that would be a good starting point and see if that still makes sense. Um. And then again the, with tax impact. If there is an opportunity to get to a point where the tax impact, the mill rate would be a zero, I think we'd want to know that number and then work off of that. You know, we can use that as kind of our, maybe our, our baseline of, you know, what can we get, what can we get where it wouldn't be a, a, a tax increase to the taxpayers and then just work off of that. If it's not enough, then obviously we got we to gotta go for more, but or at least consider that or cut more. And then those are the, those are the things I think we need going into that meeting so we can make more informed choices. Right? Mm -hmm. yep. I think I won't go on my uh, pedestal of, of the state not giving us our money. I've done that enough, uh, that money that we need. So uh, anything else before we move on? Um, I just want to point out to the sale of land, and I don't really want to get going here. That's a Band-Aid. If we, the, the possible solution, to me that's, that's not even on the list, only to extend a year out for a potential future decision on a referendum if we wanted to push it out past April. I, I think we're all would be in agreement on that, but I didn't, I, it's up there as a possible solution. It's really not. It's, it's, it's short-sighted, but it's our duty it's to a, it could be a It could be a Band-Aid for next year, is what I think we would look at that as. Uh, all right. I just want to make sure I call that out. Okay. Let's move on. Item C, update on continuation of Prescott Public School Academic Performance. And uh, Michael Kosmowski, who wears many hats, both as the Prescott Intermediate Principal and also Test Director and also um, our teacher in learning, has some exciting news. And I wanted to make sure that he got his due for the work that he has put together, um, but he's going to finalize the story for you tonight with regards to the report card and comparisons among other districts. Yeah. Right, stra strap in, everyone. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> I won't. I won't try to make this. Uh, I'll try to make this as short as possible. But again, last month I came and I uh, talked about some of our academic performance and some comparison data. So I just wanted to start with. Just a quick little review of that. It looks like I'm not connected. There we go. 
Is that me, Rick, or is that you? Okay. Is that you? <laughs> so again, I, I showed these last month to the board, and the the key here is anything in yellow means that they are lower academically achievement than Prescott. Anything blue is higher. This is our ELA data. Again, 90% of the time, 90% of the boxes, we are higher than. And then we go to our math. And again, this is grades three through 11. And Rick, Rick doesn't want to go for me, so we might have to drive here. Um, oh, that was the math, yeah. It's because you got all these fancy things. <laughs> here we go. As, you, as you're switching. This world, here we go. So, and, here's, and here's the math. And again, same, same sort of thing. 85, here it's 85% of the time we are higher than um, our comparison districts. We do include Hudson and River Falls. We, we highlight them. Um, they're much bigger districts than us, but they are our neighbors. Um, and then we also have GET and Bloomer. And again, that's because they're or demographically very similar to the Prescott School District. Tanya, you had a question? Well, I did. I mean, I think I know the answer. This is all last year's data, and when it says 2023 ACT, pre-ACT, that was actually 2022. Oh, no, it's, uh, I, I didn't change on that one, the pre-ACT yeah. part. It is, it is ACT, uh, excuse me, it is pre-ACT. Yes. We switch from ACT Aspire to yeah. ACT, pre-ACT 9, pre-ACT 10. It's the 23, It's the, that was from the 22-23 school year. Yep. So and pre-ACT. Was last year, yep, last do spring. The, do you do so this spring? is okay. all last spring's data. Gotcha. Yep. So this is all last spring data and then uh, those comparisons. So based on that, the state then creates a report card. What I am happy to say about these let me see if I'm back on here. Oh, they really did not like that, Rick. Um, <laughs> I think it burnt the ball out. It, it looks so, good it on so our bright. screen. It was so bright. Um, so when we compare to the Middle Border Conference, this is where we are. As in math and ELA, we're the number one um, overall. Elementary, ELA and math, again, we're number one. Middle school, one, two. And high school, one, three. So again, a lot of high academic achievement um, compared to our neighbors um, and oftentimes compared to even those larger districts around us. I'm try one click, here we go. All right, so let's get into the report card stuff. And again, the report card, the nice thing I can say is that no calculation has changed on the report card this year for like the first time ever. Um, so overall, it's to help schools identify areas of strength that we can build on and then pinpoint areas of need for improvement. And then definitely the report card shows that because it isn't just about academics, as uh, um, achievement, like I talked about, it's how good are our schools and are we getting any better? So the report card does look at our growth as well. So for those in the viewing audience, again, part of the report card is we're gonna get this overall score from zero to 100. It is based on our free and reduced lunch numbers. And these are our numbers for our district, we're 17.1 last year. Our elementary was the highest at 20.9, middle school is at 20, and high school is at 14. So you can see in our priority weighted areas of achievement and growth, it changes slightly based upon your free and reduced lunch numbers. So the Department of Public Instruction will say, you should not compare our overall score number to other districts because it's not a apples to apples comparison because it is, if you have more free and reduced lunch students, we know academically, <clears throat> typically they're going to be lower, but then that means we should be able to grow them more, so your growth will count for more. If you have less free and reduced lunch, then achievement should be higher, your growth counts for less. And that's how it is calculated every year. So priority era number one is that uh, achievement area. And again, it's variable weighting. It goes all the way back from there's not that skip year of COVID anymore. So it's 2021 up to last year, 22, 23. There's variable weighting on that. And then the number of students that we have that test as advanced or proficient or basic, <coughs> then also have a weight on, on those numbers as well. That all gets mixed together, three years worth of data, and then it spits out these numbers out on the left. Um, you can see what the state is at, 60.1 overall in English. We are at 77.5 is what we scored on that. And then mathematics state is a little slower, or lower at 57, and we're at 74. Again, this is comparing us to all K-12 <coughs> districts, because when they do our district report card, they really just treat us as one big school. They don't weight the high school or the middle school or the elementary more than any other building. So that was priority area number one. 
Priority number two is value added growth. And the nice thing about value added growth is that they're gonna start with all students, previous year's assessment, and they're gonna look at that norm group and how far did they grow? What was the average growth? And did our student that we had, did they fall below the average growth or were they above the average growth? So it's really a nice apples to apples comparison. Again, this one, because we're looking at growth, there is the skip year is still part of this data because it has to be full academic year students from one year to the next. So a student that moves in partway through the school year, they will still be on our achievement data. They will not be part of our growth data until they've been here. Also the growth data, when you look from one building to the next, when we send fifth graders up to sixth grade, that growth that they achieve from five to six, the intermediate school gets credited for half of that growth and the middle school gets credited for half of that growth. So it's, you're also sharing some of this growth in between buildings. But again, it's a, it's a nice uh, model because it does look at apples to apples. Where did you start? Not just what grade are you in? This is another chart, and again, these are all public now. They are posted on the Teaching and Learning website. And what this is doing is that what the state does is they set this bar scale at the bottom. This is ELA on the left, zero to six, and math, zero to six on the right, with three being the average. So what they're saying is that they're gonna take all these demographic groups. So we start with all students, <coughs> then we got by race, um, economically disadvantaged or non-economically disadvantaged, our ELL population, our students with disability, and then our students that were proficient and not proficient last year. And they say everyone should grow at 3.0. So they set the scale at 3.0. If you are to the right of 3.0, you are in these blue boxes. And if you are lower in any of these categories, we would have a white box. And I'm happy to say for the first time, both ELA and in math, we are higher than expected in growth with every single demographic area that we look at. That's a huge accomplishment on top of the <coughs> overall academic success, but now the growth success that we have with it. And that's very difficult to do, to have both of those at the same time. Priority area number three, this is our lowest quartile of students. So from the previous years, so now we're talking the year of 2022, they figured out who are our lowest achieving students. Most of our special education students fall in there, and then our low gen ed students. That group then they follow for the next year into 2023. And they basically treat this group as getting a mini report card. They're not gonna expect them to achieve as much because they are our lowest quartile, but they are gonna expect us to grow them a lot. So they're gonna weight their growth quite a bit. And then we also know with low achieving students, absenteeism is a large area, the contributing factor. And then their attendance, if they're in K-8, and did they graduate in high school. Um, again, that's three years of data that is going in to make this mini report card for your lowest quartile of students. And over to the left, these are our, our numbers, and you can see um, our target group and then our non-target group. So this is not compared to the state. This is comparing our students in uh, this one's achievement in ELA, what did this bottom quartile do? What did our students that were in the top 75% of kids do? What was the growth like? And you can see the growth is quite a bit closer. So yep, they did not uh, achieve, that's kind of expected, mm -hmm. but you can see their growth was very similar to their peers. Mathematics, again, they did not achieve, but their growth is actually higher than their peers. Right? And we talked strategically about the things the board has done and supported over the last couple of years of COVID and knowing that these, it's paying off and this growth is happening. And then our chronic absenteeism and then our graduation. You can see that, again, very similar, a little bit um, lower than our target group or our non-target um, group. And then our last part is on track to graduation. And, and this, this part of the, of the um, report card is very convoluted because it's different for every building. And if the district's report card just gets all of it put together. So the areas are chronic absenteeism, so every um, school gets that. Graduation, only the high school gets. So the high school gets chronic absenteeism and graduation. The elementary school gets third grade ELA and 
absenteeism, and the middle school gets eighth grade math and absenteeism, and then the district just gets all of it. So again, this is probably the most difficult to understand because you really aren't comparing apples to apples between buildings. And yet, and that's uh, just go back one, but it's reported as on track to graduation, right? Correct. They're using the performance in ELA or performance in math and absenteeism. Yep. This but actually has nothing to do with their performance. It just has to, uh, excuse me, the, the performance of only the third graders yeah. and only the eighth graders in math. Because yeah. those are the two pivotal years that are predictors for future success. So it's only those two cohorts of kids that are being judged on our report card. So it's a little bit more difficult because we do have those courts that come through that are a little higher or a little lower. Um, but it's the same for everyone in the state. So overall, Prescott, 77.5 out of 100 is what we scored. That is in the exceeds expectations category. So as a district, we exceed what they believe we should be able to hit. We look at our high school score, they are meeting their expectations. Our middle school score, again, exceeding expectations. And then our elementary is treated as one school. We significantly exceed our expectations again. And the detailed report card, if anyone in the public, again, this presentation is posted already. The individual report cards are posted, but you can also follow the link here to get to the district report card as well. Any questions on the calculations of the report card or the district report card before I go into the individual buildings? And kind of look at I have each one no of those categories. questions, but shout out to the middle school for increasing there. <laughs> so nice job. Mm -hmm. ahead, I think Michael. that's where we had interventions placed and all that kind of stuff too. And I think it's just a positive. I know you did a lot of work with the staff as well and stuff, so it's awesome. Yep, shows up. Yep. All right, individual buildings then. Um, and what I'm, what I'm doing here is it, within the report card, you get this overall score, which again is not good for comparison. But each one of those four categories, you now get compared to every other school in the state of Wisconsin, and you get a percentile rank. So there's two things to this percentile rank. There's a bar graph that shows you where are you as a school district, um, sort of in that mix, and then what's your percentile rank? So our high school in achievement is in the 83rd percentile. Right, so we line up all the schools in the state of Wisconsin. There's only 17 schools higher than us. 17%. It's more than 17 schools, but 17% schools. In growth, we're at the 46th percentile. You see that's pretty much kind of right in the middle of the state. 41st percentile with our that lowest quartile at the high school level. And then 61 percentile in our on track to graduation. And this is where it's so convoluted is that we're 61th percentile, but if you can see on the bar graph, we are in the top schools, even though we're at the 61st percentile. So you gotta kinda look at both of those together. So overall, academic achievement, we're there. We're, we're higher than, than you know 83% of schools. Um, in terms of our growth, our growth is more of the average growth, maybe even slightly below average. And is that same, this, did you say that growth is the same for everybody, the, the expected growth, the 3.0, or is it individualized per student? It's that it's that 3.0 yeah. that they put, but it's from the individual scores per student that they come up with the 3.0. So it really is looking at every school, student, where they started yeah. the year prior and where they ended this okay. year. And are we beating the odds or not? Middle school, 87th percentile in achievement. So top 13% of all middle schools in achievement. And this is where the middle school gets their big bump is from their growth. They're the 77th percentile in growth. And then we look at that bottom quartile where now we added interventionists. You know, we've changed some of the things that we do with special education. 80th percentile, so top 20% in that lowest group growing. And then again, 80th percentile and on track. But again, you can see we're pretty high compared to the other schools. So that on track is always the most difficult one. And again, for them, it's their math in eighth grade and attendance. That's really what goes into those. So kudos to the middle school yeah. and their growth there. And then finally, we have um, the elementary school. And elementary in terms of achievement, we're at the 90th percentile, so top 10% in achievement. 
top 8% in growth of all students, top 3% in growth of our bottom quartile of students, and then top 10% in on-track graduation. So as I emailed this to Dr. Spaguza yesterday, I said it's a, it's a clean sweep at the elementary level of being in the top 10 um, compared to the state. So, and I think there's a, really a lot of celebrations, not just at the elementary, there are a lot at the other buildings as well. And I just think uh, we need to take time to celebrate that as well and the hard work that our staff, our administration, our school board has put in over the last four years of the pandemic and planning and how to have we navigated around it. So yep. kudos to everyone. Yeah, I just wanted to thank our staff, our students for their engagement, but also for the staff, the hard work that they're doing and how they're using this information. Um, it is a year long. In the summer, we come back, we run data retreats. Um, they look at this information and it's uh, an ongoing everyday uh, feat. Um, Michael, there was, I know it, this is really an update on the report card, but there was also a US News report uh, data that was released. Do you have that at the end or would you mind speaking to? Yeah, I can just, just speak to it briefly. So uh, U.S. News and Report, they look at um, your achievement. They also, 25% um, of their score is ELA achievement, 25% is mathematics, and then they look at a, um, a different, slightly different type of, of trend growth, but 25% for your ELA and 25% for your math. And for our elementary school, um, they put us in the top 3% of all elementary schools in the state of Wisconsin. That's awesome. Wow. That's so that's an out, another outside organization outside of DPI uh, that's recognizing the work that's going on here. Thank you. Um, next couple of slides is, as I, as I said at the beginning of this, is you should not take that score out of 100 and compare to other districts because, again, that's based on free and reduced lunch numbers. But these percentile ranks are comparable. So... Yesterday when this came out, Kathy Miller and I got to mining data when the site wasn't <laughs> crashed because everyone was trying to do this yesterday. And um, I'm just going to go through the, the, the different areas here. So overall achievement. So on the left on all of the next couple slides. Um, so this is achievement. This is the, at the district level. Um, Prescott is in green. And then all those target or comparative districts that we talked about, Millboard Conference, um, Bloomer, GET, River Falls, Hudson are, are, are marked there. Um, so you can see in the middle board conference in terms of achievement, we were the highest, second only to Hudson. Um, our high school, you can see where we are here, second only to Osceola in achievement. Our uh, uh, middle school, same, only second to Osceola in our percentile rank. And then our 90.2 at the elementary was the top of any of our neighboring districts in overall achievement at the elementary level. And that's kind of our overall, out of everything put together, that's kind of the comparison. Way yep. to, that's yep. awesome. Yep. So, so that's the achievement. Next part yep. of the report card is the growth. Again, how good is our district and are we getting any better? You can see as a district, we are the highest out of any district in the area. Um, again, high school, we talked about this. Our growth is more in, that, in the middle, in the middle of the state as well, middle of our area. The um, middle school did have nice growth, did it, uh, gain quite a bit. Again, still in that middle area. And then the 92 percentile rank at the elementary is the highest, again, in comparison <coughs> with our neighbors. So as a district, number one in the middle board conference in overall achievement, number one in growth. Look at the other two categories of the report card. Just quickly here, that target group, so bottom quartile, who's doing the best with their lowest students. And again, same, same sort of story that we, that we just saw. Um, our high school's sort of in the middle, in the average. Um, our middle school's a little bit higher, and intermediate is at the very top. The only district higher than us overall is St. Croix Central. And the last group, and again, this one's the most convoluted because it depends on um, your attendance, it depends on third grade. Um, one thing that's a little bit different, it isn't quite apples to apples at the elementary level. Amory, these are, um, Amory has an intermediate school like we do. They get two different report cards. Their elementary, because it only is grade three that is part of their elementary school, they get a score in achievement, they get a score in a growth. But they don't get an overall report card. 
Their intermediate school, which is grades four and five, like we have, they do get a report card. So the AMRI numbers, um, especially in this one, this is just their four and five. And if you remember, for the on track to graduation, it was third grade reading, which you don't have in a grade four and five, and you have attendance. So really, AMRI score is their attendance. That's where they're getting theirs from. So I think if we would were to separate ours out, and next year, Altoona will be part of this mix because officially Altoona will be part of our conference. I did look at Altoona. Um, they're kind of in the middle. They're, we're quite a bit higher. Um, but at their intermediate school, like in this category, they were in the 98th percentile. Again, it's only their grade four and five attendance. Typically at the elementary school, where you're gonna have the attendance issues is kindergarten, first grade. Um, it seems like there's more mobility and then also more as a social emotional where, where kids stay home for varying reasons. So it's not quite apples to apples when we look at that. But overall you can see as a district, Somerset and Amory a little bit higher in this. Um, again, that one's the most convoluted of all of them. So middle board conference districts, again, number one in achievement, number one in growth. Um, and again, this will be coming to a Digital scoreboard near you That's um, right. in the near future. Cue um, it up, Andrew. As a district, we are in the 89.7 percentile. So technically, we're a top 10.3 percent. <laughs> if we round it, you know, it's transparency, I wanted to add the point three. Okay, but we're a top 10 district in academics and an achievement, top 15 percent in overall, excuse me, in overall growth. So again, high achievement, high growth. How do we keep it going? And you guys make difficult decisions as we look at a, as a budget shortfall. All this information is on the website. Um, there's a QR code here, a bit.ly, that you can get to it. Um, this presentation's on there, as well as every individual uh, report cards. The public report cards aren't quite the same as the ones we get, because we also get to look at the groups that are less than 20, where when we release it to the public, we do not identify uh, those groups, um, because you could identify who those students are. So. So it's just slightly different um, than what the public sees. Questions? <clears throat> Anybody have any questions, comments? Very thorough and really good information, yeah. Michael. I guess my only question, I mean, up, up, outstanding. You, you kind of you you put the seller note on it at the end, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, with with budgetary decisions, I, I hope part of what we talk about at our workshop is is uh, you know uh, a list from administration as to what we think the the, the top drivers are of success, right? Mm -hmm. And what would be you know the top um, hate to lose, sure. You know type pieces. So yep. awesome job. Yeah, and Thank you. testament to everyone, all the administration and, and faculty. This is. You guys run a you guys run a great ship. This is it's fantastic information. All three buildings, all four buildings. It's good news. Yeah, and I will say it's not. This doesn't come just from the core classrooms. You have to have students that are at school that feel supported. They have these connections with with staff, so they do perform when it comes time to perform. Because we've all been there when we sitting in an ACT or pre ACT thinking, you know, what does this really matter? You know, but. Our students are rising to the challenge, but again, that's a lot of that is that relationship building that our staff do with our students as well. So kudos to our student staff and that relationship as well. And you too, Michael. I'm sure you're up to about two in the morning putting this all together too. Sometimes. Later, over under <laughs> <laughs> on, the, on this presentation tonight, getting all this data aggregated and everything. Uh, luckily, I have a really great administrative assistant, Kathy Miller, yeah. who she came from a background of mm -hmm. data and spreadsheets. So. She geeks out on this stuff as much as I do. <laughs> That's hard to do. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> yeah, great news. Right, and, uh, a great way to head into the Thanksgiving uh, week. Um, next is uh, Andrew Caudill, our activities director, to talk a little bit about leaving no stone unturned and uh, looking at other streams of revenue. <clears throat> yeah, Dr. Spakuza asked me to give you a very brief uh, update on this, and it'll be very brief. Um, we are gonna do what we can to leave no stone unturned. So one of the revenue streams that we have available to us that we have not really tapped into is um, naming of facilities, whether it's um, outdoor, indoor, 
Um, other districts do this. Um, you see this more at the collegiate level, but op offering sponsorship opportunities to uh, businesses to essentially get naming rights over facilities, and then that um, there's a value put to that. So we are going to go ahead and, and dive into this and just see what market value is out there for um, our facilities, depending on if it's a competition facility, practice facility, uh, and what the value would be so that we can see what new revenue streams we can create. You do have a board policy around this. Um, it does require two readings. So um, this is not a reading because we don't have any names for you, but what we would do is bring back uh, specific names for you and what we were thinking um, as a first reading and then ask if it's something that we would like to do for you to take action on that in a second reading. So we are gonna dive into this, no promises. We'll see what's out there and what is available to us, but it's something we are gonna take a look at going forward. Anybody have any questions? I, I love the no stones unturned bit. How, how are you gonna do some research on what the market might bear? Yeah, I think first, let's reach out to our, our friends in our business community and just see what what they would think, because ultimately I think market's gonna, they're gonna drive the market versus versus us. We obviously don't wanna demand something that there's there would be absolutely no takers. And then just kinda see what, what they would think. We would provide information on, here's how many people would attend X event, here's what kind of signage we can do, um, and, and just what they can get out of it, because we all we all want to have a, a two-way street. We want them to get value out of it as well. Um, and that we have so many great supporters, but we, we know that, that that won't be an issue, but we want to see what they're willing to do. And I'm, I'm just, good idea, right? I'm, just, I'm super sensitive to us continuing to tap the same people over and over and over. And, and, and I would never say don't ask because they, they can make their own business decision. I just, I hope, I hope it's just, it's, it's gentle, it's respectful, and, and I just hate keep going back to the well over and over and over again, but appreciate yeah, that's the effort. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, one thing that I was told by one of our supporters is um, for something that we didn't ask them for went in a different direction, they said, you should have asked because we would have no. done it. Um, so, and like you said, be gentle, but I do think they, they at least would like to be approached and, and if it's not something they want to do, it's fine. Um, but I think most of them want to be approached at least, but we need to, like you said, be, be gentle and just see if there's a demand. There could be no demand for this. Sure. And then we just know we, we did what we could, so. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to item E, update on the status of the current infrastructure referendum work. And next steps for summer of 2024. Summer. Although uh, Mike Oika would uh, share with you, we're, we're still not done um, with some of the stuff for the summer, but um, from the summer of 23. But we did have uh, a two hour meeting um, with Mark and Johnson, River Valley Architects to start planning out the summer of 2024. Um, remember, there is still a lot of work to be done and we're gonna kind of walk through kind of the highlights for you and uh, let you know that we are reconciling the current budget at this time for what's uh, in reserve. We are currently still on target and on budget for all of the work that's been done. We have some bids, most of the bids for summer 2024 have already been completed. And so um, really what we're looking at is some additional work that might be take, uh, need to be uh, bid out and we'll be coming back uh, with that. So Malone Elementary, just to let you know, is gonna be uh, undergoing probably one of the most significant changes on the inside. Um, that building will, for the most part, be offline. That includes having to move the YMCA. Um, wanna thank both the YMCA partnership and Sarah for the work that they've been doing. Um, luckily, we've been certified previously, and so we continue to work with the state to make sure that we can continue to provide Y care for our families during the um, summer school, but also then the camps and everything like that. We are updating the HVAC system. Um, that will put most of the system all on one building automation system. Really for, if you want to geek out on it, it's what Mike Hoika does with the computer to kind of look at occupied and unoccupied, trying to drive down the costs of um, 
either lighting or uh, heat and air conditioning in this case. We are moving to all LED lighting and sensors. Um, we did not put LED lighting in um, the Malone during the 2018. That all went into what is currently the middle school. We are also updating security cameras and the buzzer. So um, that'll be uh, work that'll be taking place. Because we're doing all of the lighting and sensors and some rewiring for cameras, every single ceiling tile and the grids will be coming down. So if you remember 2018, it, it does uh, not look very inviting. So it will be a very dusty environment. Um, plumbing, um, some fine additional plumbing that will be taking place and then there are two areas of roof replacement that will be taking place um, that will keep um, you know for basically other than boilers that building will be set for a good 20 years um, we are doing window replacements that will take uh, the 1963 wing that kind of parallels Campbell and then the 2001 wing which is one that's over by uh, the uh, parking lot and uh, playground. Then we'll move over to the intermediate school at 125 Elm Street. Uh, that has a lot of the antiquated unit ventilators. Um, the primary thing that we'll be taking care of is that all the ventilators, unit ventilators on the main floor and second floor will be uh, removed and replaced. Second floor will have cooling coils and room 100, which is our STEM room. Uh, that one will be finalized. We also have a lot of stairwell cabinet heaters that are from 1950, 1960. All of those will be removed and uh, replaced. And then um, the cooling fluid that is currently in that building is no longer um, viable. And so um, we do have to uh, drain it and put in what is now um, basically um, good for the environment and that'll be taking place. Um, we'll update some of the exhaust fans. Uh, the gym circulation fans are kind of the old style. They're the, you know, they're about 12 feet in diameter. Um, the wire ones, they'll be coming down and be replaced with the kind of circular, um, kind of create that uh, kind of tornado action, but it, they're more efficient in making sure that the heating and cooling, um, depending on the season, is more um, equally distributed. We are replacing all the electrical panels and then the fire alarm. Remember that is the only building in the district at this time that does not go to a service and so that will put all of our four buildings on the same uh, uh, platform and then we'll be updating the boilers. Middle school at St. Croix, um, HVAC, um, some work there. We have the same kind of electrical uh, panels and circuitry that will be updated. Um, we have a boiler replacement. I think there are two. And this one will be 100% roof replacement. And it's the um, largest square footage. Um, what I did want to share with you is based on some of the work that we've done with um, the board and prioritizing where we put our dollars and then some of the things that we'll be coming back and working on with regards to great configurations or building configurations. Um, we do want to let you know that once we've reconciled the bills, um, it is possible that we would want to um, go beyond some of the priorities that we, Mike and I, you know, when it's lighting, we've just expanded maybe LED lighting. But if there's uh, additional projects that need to be prioritized by the board, we'll be bringing those to you in early winter so that they can be bid on and um, completed in the summer 2024. They would all be under the referendum guidelines and also part of what the Facility Advisory Committee did. But now, um, based on the finances, we might be able to expand. Anything of major uh, work, we would be coming back to you. Just wanted to make sure you are aware of that. And those are kind of the projects that will be happening on top of everything else. <laughs> Sons, we don't have to move anybody this year, which I think our custodians and football team will be very happy to hear. <laughs> Any questions? Any questions down here? <coughs> no one? Vicky? Mm -hmm. No. No. Pat or? No. Questions? Yeah, looks good. It's, will that wrap up everything from the referendum? Or will there be possibly other stuff that bleed into the following year? Um... More than likely, you know, supply chain and things like that, based on what we're finding, um, there will be some work, but it won't be as significant. I mean, this will be equally significant work yeah. um, and, uh, you know, kind of um, 
logistics, but anything that would go beyond that is not going to be anything that would be as disruptive as what we'll experience these two summers. So far on budget, everything's on budget. Yep. Okay. Yeah, no, we're uh, sitting. That, that's why I, I was hesitant to say that we might be able to bring some projects back to you, but it looks like um, we are. Um, on budget and maybe even under budget and might be able to expand some of the work that was um, at that time when we did the bids two years ago um, weren't able to be uh, executed. It also I, I think what's really impressive is I think uh, both Michael and Kyle um, have been talking with their staff and so some of the things that they wanted to do is live in their buildings and we're only four months in but also with Vision 2035 they're talking not only about current um, adaptations to the facility to meet the current needs of programming but what's the future and I think to Helen's point you know at some point you know we have to talk and um, uh, we have to talk about what would we do if we consolidated and so those are things that won't will go beyond this referendum but it would be some things that you could talk about underused underdeveloped spaces and right now at the middle school we're looking at the wrestling room and weight room um, looking at the stem and we're looking at the overhang okay all right thanks rick we're going to move on to item f type a publication regarding board election so it is the time of year where, um, by statute, we have to identify that there are two board seats that will be up for the April election. Um, they're the two individuals sitting to my right. So it's Tanya and Pat. And um, this will be published, I believe, Courtney, in next week's paper. Yep. 11.22. Um, it does say if uh, anybody is going to run that the de declaration of candidacy must be at the district office no later than 5 p.m. on Tuesday, January 2nd. The district office, for anybody interested, is located in the lower level of our middle school at 1220 St. Croix. You guys got any questions about this one? <laughs> I don't want to miss the date, so I already put an appointment on my calendar. Okay. All right. <laughs> Uh, we'll move on. We're at back at the recognition of visitors. Anybody care to be recognized? Yep. Hi, Israel Haas here again. Um, this is the unscripted version of what I started <laughs> earlier. And just want to say again, thank you guys uh, for all of your leadership. I know you have really difficult decisions to make with all of this. Some questions uh, did come up, and just to answer uh, Pat real quick, mm -hmm. we're happy to consult in any way that we can. Uh, I'm a volunteer, I have limited uh, availability, but we do have two resources that are still on loan from the National Park Service. You heard from one of them. Um, Holly Larson, Barrett Steenrod is also available. If we have, uh, you guys have phenomenal resources within your administrative uh, staff. They have tremendous experience, wide depth of knowledge, know what's going on. We trust you guys, but if there's any, any way that we can be a resource, happy to help in any way that we can. So uh, thank you again for all your leadership. And uh, I didn't have to script anything because I had to make sure I was on for three <laughs> minutes. So I had to read my phone and make sure I got my three minutes in today. Uh, I'm under my, under my quota. Well done. Thank you, Israel. Anybody else? Okay, we, the board, are going to consider a motion to convene in closed session under exemptions 1985-1 E and C, and I assume we're not meeting in the Prescott High School Library meeting in room. Yeah, so be uh, administrative office 106, is that right? Room 106, Josh, can we call it 106? Administrative office number. Is that 106? He lived down there. 104? Uh, 104? We will meet in the administrative office. 117. Oh, that sounds right. 117? We're going to meet down in the administrative office. Room will figure it out. Uh, the statutes we're, we're convening on will be 1985 1E deliberating or negotiating the purchasing 
of public properties, the investing of public land funds are conducting other specified public business whenever competitive or bargaining reasons require closed session. And then one, 1985-1C, dismissal, considering promotion, compensation, and performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction are exercises responsibility. And just as a reminder, we're coming out of closed session and we'll immediately adjourn uh, from open session after that, there will be no votes made in this in this uh, closed session. So thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Um, wait, we, we need a motion. Vote? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Motion to go into. We need. We need we a need motion to go into closed session. No, nope. you, you're motioning to go okay. into closed. You yep. adjourn at um, eleven. Yep. I move to convene in the closed session under exemptions 1985, 1E, and C at Prescott High School, room 117, at 8.30 p.m. I'll second. Nice job. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you.